The Paul Leslie Hour, helping people tell their stories. And now, your host, Paul Leslie. Hey, it's me. Thanks for joining us, ladies and gentlemen. It's another episode of the Paul Leslie Hour. And this time around, we are joined by a very talented woman, Paula Atherton. She's a saxophonist, vocalist, performing and recording artist. She's recently released her fifth album entitled Shake It and performing all over the place. It's great to have you with us. Uh, my pleasure. Thanks so much for having me. Oh, it's it's our pleasure. So tell us, has music always been a natural thing for you? Uh, yeah, ever since I was a kid, I always loved music. I wanted to have lessons when I was a really little kid, but... Um, there weren't any musicians in my family, so I think I, did, I think they didn't take me seriously. I was asking for a piano when I was around five, and I guess they just thought I heard something or saw something somewhere. So I wasn't really taken seriously. But, um, yeah, music's always been a great love for me. As time went on, I started writing. That's pretty much what my recording career is about, the contemporary jazz recordings that I've released. It's about my um, songwriting. So that's become like another facet of what I do. So how did you begin to compose melodies? How did that start? So I'm thinking about the first song that I wrote, which which was uh, something that I wrote for my mom, who I lost when I was uh, 13. And, you know, I get ideas for songs all different ways. This particular time I was sitting at the piano. I just started fooling around with, with some chords and some melodies and I, I wound up writing that on the piano. Sometimes I'll hear a melody when I'm playing one of my instruments or when I'm at walking my dog, or sometimes I hear a lyric idea and I go from there. It's all different. I usually wind up saving stuff. I've, I've been doing the last few uh, releases in a little um, app in my phone <laughs> because uh you know, it's so handy that when I, I get an idea for something rather than forget it, at least if I get an idea of what it was I was thinking, otherwise it could just be, you know, gone forever. So I've been kind of using that to catalog things. And then, you know, I start like getting them in the computer or writing them out on manuscript or something. And, and then we start uh, the recording process. Who would you say your biggest musical influences are? A lot of uh, musicians in the jazz field, but, you know, some pop and, and R&B artists also are uh, very influenced by Charlie Parker, Miles Davis, Lester Young, Ella Fitzgerald, Sarah Vaughan, Roy Eldridge, and all those great pioneers of traditional jazz. I think anybody that plays alto is going to be influenced by Charlie Parker. But any contemporary player, I think, is also going to be influenced by someone like Dave Sanborn, who, you know, really changed contemporary music. I think music would be different without him. I don't think anybody would argue with that. And even some R&B, some classic R&B people like, you know, Marvin Gaye, Aretha Franklin, Stevie Wonder, Earth, Wind & Fire, of course. And some pop people, too, I listen to, some really great songwriters. John Mayer, I think, is a great songwriter. Corn Bailey Ray. You know, that's why my music's kind of eclectic, because I like all different types of music. So I think you'll hear, you know, bits of that in different songs. Great variety of stuff there. And I have to say, in listening to your music, something that I thought, wow, that was an interesting idea, and it really came off great. And I'm talking about your cover of the song Lowrider. Yeah, that. You know, I was talking to my friend Skylar Deal, who's a, a great producer, bass player, really imaginative guy, songwriter. So he's worked with me on at least one track. Um, let's see. I don't remember if he, I think he was on my first one too. I think he's been on pretty much every release. So anyway, I, I knew that he was the guy to come up with this. So I, I started to talk to him. I said, you know, I don't usually do a lot of covers, but we were thinking about doing a cover of Low Rider, and he called me back like I, literally a couple of days later and said, "I got the track." I'm like, "What do you mean you have the track?" <laughs> he said, "I I got it. I got it. I heard it, 
in my head and I recorded it. I'll send you I'll send you a demo of it. And of course I loved it. It's a really fun tune to play live. I guess it's kinda of like unexpected, you know. People don't it like low rider, you mean the war tune? <laughs> <laughs> you know, what'd you do with that? But I'm glad you enjoyed it. I, I thought that it was brilliant. I thought his uh idea about the uh remake was, was totally brilliant. And he's um that's him doing the voiceover. He's also playing bass and guitar on it. And Dave Delhomme is playing keyboards on it. He used to be in the um Ricky Minor band on Tonight Show with Jay Leno. Oh yeah. Yeah. So um really fun track. This might be a tough question, but of the musicians you have collaborated with, who would you say has impressed you the most? Impressed me. Yeah, that is a tough question to answer. Well, I have to say Skyler's always surprising me. <laughs> hes uh, You never know what he's going to come out with. I've been blessed to be able to collaborate with some great musicians, uh, of course, including him. You know, Napoleon wrote a song for Shake It called My Song For You. He also guested on my release before that, um, Remember When, and he wrote a song for my third release, Enjoy the Ride, called Sassy Strut. And Nick is just a great musician and a great human being. And getting to work with my good friend and great musician, uh, Cindy Bradley, is always a lot of fun. She plays trumpet on uh, a couple tracks on the last few, last few releases. She also featured me on one of her tracks uh, at the end of 2017, I think, called Girl Talk. And that's kind of like a trumpet and sax duet that was really fun. I got to collaborate with a bunch of people over over these albums. Kelly Minucci from Special Effects. He's on my second release. He's on Block Party. Greg Adams from Tower Powers on uh, two singles or two of the songs on uh, Groove With Me, my second release. Gail Johnson is on uh, Ear Candy on Breakdown, one of the tunes on there. Bill Heller uh, co-wrote and produced two songs on Shake It. We did New Color and what was the other one? Oh, You Got It. Yeah, You Got It. So, yeah, I mean, getting to collaborate with musicians that are of that caliber, it's really great. And uh, it's a blessing. and It's just really inspiring to get to work with people like that. The listeners out there, they can visit your website, and it's paulaatherton.com. They're going to see a lot of dates, a lot of tour dates. Where would you say has been your favorite place to perform? I love playing. I love playing anywhere, but, you know, the West Coast is really kind of special for me because I live on the East Coast, and I don't get to go out there that much. Playing at Spagatini's was really fun. I don't know. There's so many venues. Like now that I'm, now that you're asking me, if I looked at a list of them, I'd be like, oh yeah, I remember that one. But uh, Denver, I got to play a few different venues in Denver. Jazz at Jacks. Played another place with Tony Exum last year, which was kind of like a club, but like a car museum that was really uh, interesting to play at. BB King's in New York. We we lost that place, I think, last year. They went out of business, but that was really fun. I got to do a gig there with Cindy Bradley and Adam Hawley July a year ago. And I got to play at the Blue Note in Manhattan with uh, Hank Jones before he passed away. I got to do a week there. It was a tribute to Frank Sinatra. So that was being in the Blue Note's a pretty special place since everybody has played there. So that, that was pretty exciting. I could go on and on. <laughs> <laughs> well, where would be a place anywhere in the world that you would like to play that you haven't? Italy. Why Italy? Well, uh, my mother's side of the family is Italian. My grandpa was from Italy, and uh, I got to visit there briefly. I got to visit two cities there when I was doing a gig in France. And just everything about the people, the food. The history, the architecture, the art, it's just, it just seems to be a magical place. Anybody I've ever spoken to that's gone there, 
loved it. So that's that's where I'm dreaming about going. When I said, why Italy, you could have said, why not? <laughs> <laughs> okay, so you're, you're in agreement with me oh, about that. I mean, nobody's going to say, oh, I have to go to Italy. <laughs> right. <laughs> it's just not going to happen, you know? <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Well, on the note of Italy and Italians, you mentioned a moment ago Frank Sinatra. That's an artist who brought all of these classic songs into the public consciousness. I'm curious to know, what do you think about the classic tunes, the standards, as they're called? Well, I mean, my education in jazz, which is a, is a lifelong thing, <laughs> started with playing straight ahead or traditional jazz and learning a lot of the uh, classic songs or standards. I still do a bunch of gigs like that in New York and the New York area where I sing and play those. So I try to keep them fresh in my mind. There's so much to be learned from learning those songs, the chord structure, being able to solo over chord changes like that. There's a lot to be learned from it education wise and just you know, where where art is concerned, creating, you know, just playing over them, recording them, making them your own, making your own uh, arrangement of an of a old tune, you know, bringing it, like the, the thing that we did with Low Rider, you know, just taking it out of context and doing something completely different with it. There's just like a wealth of, there's so much material and, and so much that can be done with it. I think, you know, it should be part of anybody's... Uh, musical education. Do you think that jazz music gets the respect that it deserves? Overall, probably not. I think that there needs to be more education, more access to hearing it and and knowing about it. There's so many distractions in the world today. It just seems, you know, I have some private students and their attention spans seem to be getting shorter and shorter and it's not just kids. I mean, we have so many things going on in the world at the same time. You know, if you want to appreciate jazz, some people just appreciate it, don't really know much about it. They just like the feeling it gives them or whatever. But, you know, for other people, it's it's kind of better if they understand it a little bit. For a musician, you really kind of, to be able to play it, some people can do a certain amount by ear, but I, I really think it's, uh, I think you need, you need both worlds. You need to know what it is that you're doing and then you can use the creative side of your brain and, and do something with that, you know, and it's just the marriage of those two. What is the best thing about being Paula Atherton? Well, I get to write and record my own music and go out and play it. And sometimes people come up to me and they'll say, you know, I was feeling really bad today, and and I came out and see you, and and you made me happy. You made me smile. I mean, it's it doesn't get better than that, you know. It just it doesn't get better than that. I have a um I studied music therapy in school, and I do a bit of that when I'm not touring, and I play music for some cancer patients and um, some people in hospice and. I work with some Alzheimer patients and you get so much back from doing that kind of work. It's, it's, it's hard work. On one hand, it takes a lot out of you, but you really get so much back. And I think it, it helps me as a performer, you know, give, give back to the audience. It just, it's, you know, some of it is hard to explain, but you know, if you ever, if you can understand what I'm talking about, It's like a gift for me to be able to do that. I want to call the attention to the audience. The website, again, it's paulaatherton.com. You can also follow her on Instagram like I just did. It's at Paula Atherton Music. I always like to give the artist the microphone. Just give them the stage at the end. Let them say whatever they want to whoever is listening. What would you say to the people who are tuned in? I'd say, well, first of all, I thank them for tuning in and uh, for supporting jazz in general and and just music. 
music and music education is so important to the growth of, you know, kids in school and just for the world and world peace. You know, the arts in general, if people are involved in learning how to play an instrument or painting or something in the arts, that's a positive thing. They're creating things. It's helping their brain. It's like the opposite of being destructive. So I just think, you know, a lot of times music education is considered to be peripheral in schools. It's not. It's one of the most important things that can be taught. And it's something that keeps us all together as a people. So please support music, support jazz, and support the arts, you know, locally and globally. It's really important. Well spoken. Thank you very much for spending time with us. Uh, My pleasure. Thanks so much for having me. It was a lot of fun. Our pleasure. And thank you to Terry Kane for making the connection. Yes, thank you. I hope to... uh, Hope to see you in performance sometime. Absolutely. Well, I'll definitely uh, put you on my email list and make sure I send you uh, my notices so you know when I'm going to be around. Beautiful. All right. Well, you have a wonderful day. Thanks so much, Paul. Thanks again. You have a great day. My pleasure. Thank you. Okay. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. doodly beep bop goodbye